welcome. Uh, this is part two of a, part, a four part series on the Beatitudes, the attitudes that we should be oh, okay. in order to live a kingdom full life that the Lord intended for us to live. Hallelujah. Amen. So Stephen R. Covey famously said, the biggest problem with communication is us not listening to understand, but listening to reply. How many of us have experienced that before? Right? Not only an issue that we have, but also a new experience. So do we have ears to hear today? Yes. Are we ready to hear from the Lord? Yes. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, have your way. So we start the sermon the Beatitudes with the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 5. Actually, in Matthew 5, 1 it starts. Today we'll be doing the third and fourth Beatitudes. I'll read them for us. So we start in Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. So the Beatitudes are our posture for us to be in, in Christ. This can and most often is the opposite way of thinking and behavior that the world would have us do. The Beatitudes are the goal markers of us believers. In part one, we taught about being spiritually bankrupt in Christ, knowing we have nothing of value within ourselves to offer Him, and the necessity for us to come to Jesus from a position of complete submission and humility. So recognizing our poverty, our wretchedness before our holy God is where we start, that's our starting point. You've heard it said, it cannot, we cannot recognize our Savior without recognizing we need to be saved. So we have to have an understanding that we need the Lord and He is our Savior. So we taught patience and long-suffering and how to cultivate our garden, which is our lives, our relationships, and our spiritual well-being, uh, based in Galatians 5, 22-24, the fruits of the Spirit. So today we will dive deeper into what it looks like to walk in the attributes of kingdom character through the study of the second and third Beatitudes and the spiritual fruit of peace and self-control. Hallelujah. Amen. Are we ready? Yes. yes. Amen. So let's dive into the third Beatitude. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. This is the third one in our series. Mourning. Loss. Have you ever truly mourned to the point where you absolutely wail or cry out? You scream that loud, guttural scream where you feel as though you literally have nothing left and nowhere else to go. You feel isolated and alone, devastated, wrecked, splintered, shattered. The Greek word for mourn is pentho, from the word penthos, which means mourning. It also means to mourn for and lament. Pentho denotes loud mourning, such as the lament for the dead or for a severe painful loss. It's a grief and sorrow that is caused by such a profound loss. And I'm sure everybody can relate. I'm sure at some point everyone has felt this, where they literally have nothing left. When I held my father's hand and he passed away in 2021, I was crushed. I felt a weight like nothing else. I have prayed for God's will to be done for my father, um, but I wasn't ready for it when it happened. You think you are, but you're not. He chose medically assisted after watching his father, my grandfather, progress through Alzheimer's to the full end of the disease, and he wanted to spare us. I was conflicted with my father's eternal fate. I was worried in choosing to take your life, but you would not end up in heaven. 
a friend told me that I should tell him he's brave for choosing that because he was being as selfless as any father could be to spare us the grief and the horrific disease that happened when my grandpa went into the home. So I calmly sat, humming how great that hurt, and I felt my own breath leave along with his. I was shattered, I was crushed, I was splintered and lost. I was alone despite having people in the room with me, but not alone, because someone was there with me, someone held my hand. He calmed my raging sea, and he guided the process in his time, his perfect and pleasing time. He gave us a chance to say goodbye, to accept this inevitability, and he answered my prayer. So if you're not familiar with how the May process works, with dementia patients, it's different. So you are not clearly in sound mind the day of when it happens. You maybe can't tell the date. Maybe you can't tell who's in the room with you. But you have to have been of sound mind when you set the process up. Then there is a series of appointments with the doctor who will be performing it, where he meets you at regular intervals with just the person, and they have to be able to coherently explain that they understand what's about to happen. And they have to coherently explain it every time they meet, because if they are not coherent enough in one of those meetings, everything is thrown out, and it's done. And there's no going back. So my prayer was that if this was God's will, I wanted to not make it until the day it was supposed to happen and have everything fall apart on that day. So my dad had chosen to do it before we moved back to Alberta. He decided he wanted to do it before we left the province, and he wanted to go knowing that we would know that he knew who we were. That was important for him. So if you know dementia as well, like forget minute to minute, it's second to second. So at any point in that whole stage, everything could have fallen apart, and that would have just been that. So the week prior, I was fortunate to spend a lot of time with him, um, a lot of tearful time, a lot of calm conversations that are guided, I'm sure, by the hand of the Lord, because I certainly never felt calm during that time. Um, we had many, many good conversations, and I know that God was there holding us together. And then the day finally came, the 19th of June, 2021. It was the day before Father's Day, so I apologized to my husband and said, Father's Day will probably never be the same for you now, and he was fine with that. Um, but on that day, my dad was the most coherent. He had been in probably a year. He was the most at calm, at peace, and the most mentally with it and his faculties that he had been for a very long time. So I know that God was there. Only Jesus himself could have performed that miracle. So my father surveyed the room. We locked eyes and he said to the doctor, I'm ready to see my parents in heaven. And I believe only Jesus and God could have orchestrated such movements of the spirit, aligned those situations and made everything happen so peacefully as it had done. So as broken as I was on that day, God showed up faithfully like he always does. Yeah, we've all been there. Maybe not in that situation, but you've all had situations like that. We've all been in Penthos. We've been in lament. But, you know, so has God. And while he goes through it with us, he also watched his only son on the cross be crucified and out there. So he himself wept. Jesus wept when Lazarus died, and that's important. Jesus, the God-made man, he knows how we feel. So let's take a look at this beatitude a little more in depth. And just like last time, let's take a look at some other versions of the wording of this beatitude. Does anybody have a Bible? And last time I said this and no one answered. So let's get out a Bible and somebody help me out. Good, there you go. Sherry, what do you have? <laughs> I have them all. You have them all. Yes. So what's what do you like to read? Which version? Uh, ESV. Okay, and what does the ESV say? For oh. I have to pull back. That's Matthew 5. And that is the third one? Yes. Um, 
Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Okay. Does anybody have a New King James? So New King James says, Blessed are those who mourn, and the emphasis is on blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Any other versions present? The message version says you're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. And the Amplified Bible gives perhaps one of the most accurate descriptions of the underlying message here. It says blessed, and then in brackets it says forgiven, refreshed by God's grace, are those who mourn, in brackets again, over their sins and repent, for they will be comforted. And the end note says, when the burden of sin is lifted. So refreshed by God's grace, the burden of sin is lifted. The burden is lifted. So yeah, we physically mourn loss, profoundly. But we also have the sin death in our lives that is mourned, and the grief process as we trade the worldly losses for the kingdom values that develop our character. So we're all familiar with the story of Lazarus. I don't think I need to reread it in the interest of time, um, but I encourage you to reread it later and just go over the various sections of it. Um, I just want to break down a few sections that I believe are analogous in our grief journey as we break away from sin. It shows us the way to eternal life and following Christ. So it starts in John 11, if you need to know where it is. Uh, verses starts at verse 1, but it goes all the way up to verse 44. So Jesus delayed going when he heard that Lazarus was sick. Um, there was timing around this miracle. Wouldn't he have loved to have spared his dear friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, this whole entire ordeal, knowing that he could have saved Lazarus? Jesus, the man of miracles, could have healed him immediately. But it was necessary. They had to make that journey. And they had to do that part of their journey alone from the Lord. How often do we do a section of that journey feeling like we're alone and separated from our Lord? But it's necessary to the process. When Jesus arrived, he found out Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. How long do we ourselves live in that period of decay when we have our sins? He would smell of rot. And you know, that is what happens. Sin permeates and it rots. And then it just goes everywhere. It doesn't take long before it's taken over so many different areas. But the thing is that there is beauty in this because we are never too rotten to ask Jesus to answer and to come to us. And in verse 23, Jesus assures Martha that Lazarus will rise again. Just as he brings us back to our new lives after sin, he always assures us that there is a new life that is abundantly rich in blessing. In verse 25, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives in believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? He asked. Sisters, belief in Christ can put all sinful life to death. Walking with Christ aligns us all in a spiritual life in step with him. And this means we have to put to death the things of this world that separate us from Jesus. Whoever believes in him commits to a life richly spent with him. In verse 32, Mary reached the place where Jesus was. She saw him and she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And how often do we do this? We place the blame on someone else for something we ourselves have done. We need to take some ownership. Lord, where were you? Lord, how could this happen? We need not to look that far. We know God is close to us and he's with us until the end of time. But are we listening to hear him? Do you see him? Sometimes we think, um, why have you left me? Where were you? Only to see after that he was there orchestrating every step along the way and making everything happen that happened in his time and in his will. In verse 38, Jesus said, take the stone away. And in verse 43, he said in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Jesus will always be present with us and for us in all circumstances. 
He waits for us patiently. He waits in pentos, in mourning, and in lament for us. And he won't come unless we ask him. He will wait until we have our true repentance of heart. Matthew 7 reminds us, ask and it will be forgiven to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Jesus is always so close. But unless we ask him to enter, he won't open that door himself. He will wait at the door. But you need to open the door. He'll follow us. He'll pursue us. But he doesn't cross that boundary. Until that stone is rolled away and he calls, you need to run to him when he calls. He mourns our life and then he calls us. The spirit stirs us. It conflicts us. And towards the end, in verse 43 to 44, he said, Jesus said in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. His hands and feet were wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. When you come to Jesus, when you've been in that tomb, when you've been rotting, when you've been permeating in your sin and working through it, and finally the door is opened and you are called to come out, you're constricted in those linens. Those grave clothes are tight. You've been tightly bound in that sin. It's wrapped around you. It's hard to walk in that. You're stumbling. You can't see. We stagger. It's uncomfortable. We're used to living in that worldly pattern. It's hard to live an upright life and to change your posture. We're a little bit like children, kind of stumbling when we learn to walk. Our sin is so tightly constricting. But we can allow Jesus to take those off, remove the scales from our eyes, see our sins for what they are, and help us walk a right and a new, just like Lazarus, in a new life. We need to come to him. He will not come in. He will wait at that entrance, but he won't come in. We need to call him. We need to call him and ask him to come to us. So we thank him for this mercy and this new beginning. But in this journey, we have worldly feelings, worldly emotions. Um, these things can be truly overwhelming in our lives if we let them. Just as children feel things so intensely, you know, we feel so much in all of this. So I wanted to talk a little bit about shame and guilt and what role these play. Isaiah 53.3 says, He was a man despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, and yet we considered him punished by God. When we sin, we feel ashamed. We feel shame for our behavior. We feel embarrassed, guilt. This plays a role in our ability to move past things and let them go. We're always being drawn back. You're being pulled back by the thoughts you have. And too often we are being pulled back because we fail to surrender this and leave it at the cross for Christ. So there's an important distinction I want to make today between shame and guilt. Shame is a painful feeling of humiliation or distress caused by the consciousness of wrong or foolish behavior. It causes you to feel ashamed. Dr. Taylor Lau in the book of Defending Shame defines it as a painful emotion that arises from the emotion that one has fallen short of some standard, ideal, or goal. The key word being emotion. Shame can be public, it can be private. We can look in a mirror and feel shame about the 10, 20, 40, 50 pounds that we maybe have gained. Or we can feel ashamed of how we handled something when we're out in public. How many times do we think at three in the morning, 10 days later, that you now have the perfect way to have handled that situation from four weeks ago. <laughs> Either way, this is an emotional response. It's important to remember that it's a feeling, it's an emotion, and that is rooted in this world. It's worldly, it's untrustworthy, because it's something we ourselves have created, and it's a tool by the enemy to draw a line between you and God. In Jeremiah 17, he speaks of the heart as deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? The heart produces these strong emotions. 
It inclines us to this world. We have the choice to pursue worldly happiness or pursue God. Now, Jeremiah was speaking in a time of chaos and moral backslide. Um, Babylon, Egypt, and Assyria had battled for world supremacy, and Judah was caught in the middle of this triangle. And Judah's deterioration stemmed from just a callous disregard to God, disobedience to God. More likely, they followed their hearts, and they disregarded God's warnings. So there is danger in emotions linked to this world. Guilt, by comparison, is defined in Wikipedia as a moral emotion that occurs when a person believes or realizes, whether accurately or not, that they have compromised their own standards of conduct or have violated moral universal standards and bear significant responsibility for that violation. Guilt is closely related to the concepts of remorse, regret, and shame. However, the difference is that guilt is objective. It's a truth. You're either guilty or you're innocent. There's some form of fact to that. And guilt can be pardoned. You can be forgiven. Shame, being not as objective, is not an absolute truth. It can arise out of our guilt, but it's only an emotion. It's a trick. So here's an example to illustrate this that we can all relate to. Mom guilt, which should probably more appropriately be called mom shame. When my kids were little, my husband was away a lot, and I would have to do a lot of throw-together dinners because I had to do things quickly. I was working. They were always moving. And so I would throw together these dinners. And I would feel mom guilt over the fact that I felt like I never fed them enough fruits or vegetables, right? You always think you want to give them so much extra vegetables. So, for example, like my pasta sauce would have a ton of grated vegetables into it, but I still felt like I didn't give them a separate portion of vegetables, so I wasn't doing good enough. And even now, I still fight that with teenagers because they'll never choose to eat that themselves. <laughs> so I always feel like I need to give them more, right? They have to have one good meal. But, you know, their french fries and baby carrots that they tell me are vegetables are clearly not what I'm thinking of as vegetables. But where does that guilt come from? Is there anywhere in the Bible that actually says you need to feed ten servings of fruits or vegetables a day for your kids to make them healthy? Mm -hmm. There's nowhere in there that says it. What I'm actually feeling is shame. It's not guilt. Because there's no truth to it. It's not in the Bible. It's just that I feel the shame over it. It's the shame over this ideal, this standard, that I, if I'm a good mom, I'm doing this. Is it true? No. Also, you pray over your children every day. I feel like maybe I haven't taught my children how to pray well enough. So I feel this mom guilt over it. Or shame. You see guilt versus shame. Have I probably in theory taught my children how to pray? Yeah. But I feel like I can never quite do enough. And in allowing that feeling to come in, I also allow the enemy to drive that little bit of wedge there. To make me feel like I'm not good enough for God. Right? It's a trick. So you need to be conscious of that. Whether you're feeling an emotion or whether there's truth in what you're saying. He's a thief. He pushes us to seek happiness at all costs. All over the Bible, we see examples of people who have turned their heart from God and pursued worldly happiness over the ways of the Lord. In the book of Jeremiah, because of their sin, Jerusalem itself was destroyed. The temple was ruined. The people were captured, carried off to Babylon. They didn't heed God's message, but the good news and the hope lies that our God is compassionate, and because of Christ, our hearts can be transformed. That cross bears our sin and shame and guilt, giving way to a new life built on serving the Lord. Unconfessed sin will separate us from God. We can't blame anyone else for our sins because we're given free choice in this world to make our plan, make our choice. We're given the tools we need, and we're given the Spirit to help direct us. We can either surrender, which follows the life of Jesus, and he assures us of peace and blessings comfort when we do this route. He promises us when we mourn, we will receive comfort. We can follow him with our whole heart, we can be truly free, or we can remain bound in the burial linens like Lazarus, constricted, rotting, 
struggling in our own self-worth, with Jesus standing at the entrance calling us, but waiting for us. 2 Corinthians 1, 3-4 says, Praise be to God and Father of Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we, receives our, we ourselves receive from God. We need to exercise self-control in order to avoid these same traps in the world. When we pursue personal happiness at the expense of betraying Christ-like examples that we're given, we're not exercising self-control. We're not surrendering. And more importantly, we're allowing the devil to win. Ezekiel says, but I will spare some, for some of you will escape the sword when you're scattered among the lands and nations. Then in the nations where they have been carried captive, those who escape will remember me. Now I have been grieved by their adulterous hearts which have turned away from me, and by their eyes which have lusted after their idols. They will loathe themselves for the evil they have done, and all detestable practices. And they will know that I am the Lord. I did not threaten in vain to bring this calamity on them. Because of their sin, God allowed the nation of Judah to fall. Ezekiel assures us the day will come when God will restore those who turn away from sin. The question is, will God have to break your heart before that can happen? Do you long more for this world than you do for a heart longing for God? Do you long for this more than enough to make a, ch make a change, to hear the word of the Lord? In this passage, the people needed a new attitude, but they refused to change. So God humiliated them. They were subjected to pain, suffering, and defeat. They needed the ears to hear the Spirit convicting in those areas. Can you hear and respond enough to hear Jesus' voice as Lazarus did? To let him remove those linens and let you walk? Galatians reminds us, For through the law I died to the law, so that I may live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith to the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I think when we look at all these Beatitudes, we can almost see every fruit of the Spirit in every single one of them if we think about them. But I think in the mourning process, blessed are those who mourn, finding comfort, our hearts and our minds are seeking rest. We need peace. We need to find a heart peace that's only rooted in God. In the rebirth of ourselves in Christ, we find a love so amazing and a place of contentment in our hearts that only comes from a life that is aligned with Christ. Amen. Through redemptive and salvation, we align with God, and there's no room for guilt or shame. We can live free. We can untie those feelings and emotions. Mm. So in your books, there is an exercise to take home for personal reflection. It's designed to help guide your place to a place of peace in your heart and mind as you wrestle through maybe some strongholds the Lord's convicting on you. I encourage you to maybe find a small group or find a companion or a friend and talk through some of those things. It sometimes helps you wrestle through them. Helps you encourage one another, hold each other up. Romans six Romans eight, six to ten says the mind is governed by the flesh and death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. And Paul makes a clear distinction of those who are dominated by their sinful nature versus those controlled by the Holy Spirit. You cannot find peace through living a life that is weighed down in sin, wrapped with guilt, living with shame, destined to be destroyed. Strongholds make us hostile, and they harden us, they make us brittle. You'll never find peace if you are living in any of those emotions. Isaiah 26 reminds us that you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast, because they trust in you. The path of the righteous is level. You, the upright one, make the way of the righteous smooth. Yes, Lord, walking in the way of your laws, we wait for you. Your name and renown are the desires of our hearts. Perfect peace. It's only achieved in a life consecrated in Christ. The path of righteous, who will make their steps aligned with Christ and his example, it's not easy. 
it's bumpy, it's uneven, it's not smooth ground, I would probably fall the whole way down the hill. But for the cross, yeah. but for Jesus, God is there and he can help us. He will give us a hand and he will pull us up over and over again. And the great news in that is that we don't have to go all the way back to the beginning when that happens. We just pick up and we can move on in step with someone who holds us up right the whole time. We can be reminded from James last time we talked about grieving, mourning, wailing, in sincere sorrow, and then humbling yourself. So we just need to trust that he'll bring such peace that he will lift you higher than you ever imagined. And we don't need to do it alone. We just surrender and we go to the cross. Amen. Hallelujah. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this promise that we can hold on to. That as we mourn our sin and the things of life that happen to us, that mm -hmm. not only will he give us peace, but he will be with us in the midst of it all. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. As we move on to the fifth beatitude, Jesus promises us that blessed are the, are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So we have to ask ourselves, what is meekness? Biblical meekness, not meekness of the world. So biblical meekness is gentle. It's not weak or cowardice or to be trampled on. The world will tell you that if you're meek, you're, you're weak, you're soft. And then we take that advantage of. But God flips that on its head and teaches us about true meekness, meekness that we can only find in Christ. So biblical meekness is non-aggression. It's choosing not to act on one's own strength, depending and trusting in the Lord. It demonstrates itself as a quiet spirit who is genuinely self-sacrificing. This is biblical meekness. So Jesus, who has been given all power, all might, and all authority, the Word, who created the heavens and the earth, demonstrated to us meekness as power being under control. Hallelujah. So in Philippians 2, 9-11, we read that, Therefore God has highly exalted him, and given him the name which is above every name, that at that name every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those on the earth, and of those under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Hallelujah. Amen. So he has been given all power, all authority, all might. So Jesus who commands heaven's armies, think about that. He demonstrates to us true humility and meekness. Talk about knowing who you are and what you can do. So when Judas was, uh, you know, betraying Jesus to the high priest, they were, they were forcefully getting ready to take him in. And Jesus' disciples tried to defend him. One of them with the sword, actually, the Bible records that one of the Pharisees' ears was cut off. And Jesus said, Do you not know that I could pray to my Father and he would send legions of help. And what does, it, what does that mean, the gravity of that statement there? In the Old Testament, we know of one angel who struck down 185,000 men of the Assyrian army overnight. That's in 2 Kings 19.35. So when Jesus says <coughs> that he could ask his father, and he would send him a host of angels to defend him. One angel, one angel, defeated 185,000 fighting men. This is power under control. Strength under control. So, if ever there was someone who could defend themselves, it was Jesus. Yet he teaches us another way, another way to live, another way to be and to allow our Father and Him to defend us in our lives in all the different situations. So the Greek meaning for control, strength under control, is pros. In order to wield this power under control, Jesus had to be free from hatred and vengeance. 
Jesus had to love even those who were persecuting him. He had to be free from hate and free from the desire to get back at you or to show them who's really in control. So one of the apostles, if you remember, he famously said, let's just call down fire and burn stones on them, yeah. right? Because he knew that Jesus could do it. So in his human understanding, he said, well, why not? Why not show that power? Show them, right? But in order to have strength and power under control and weakness, we need to behave the way Jesus behaved. So there's a death to self and meekness. <coughs> Hallelujah. What is this benefit though? Why die this lowly death of humility and submission? Well, Jesus says there is a benefit. The benefit is that you will inherit the earth. Right? So what, what does inherit the earth mean? The Bible says that the Lord, is, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. That means it all belongs to him. So if he tells you you can inherit it, then that means that you can inherit it. So just as Jesus can command legions of angels to come to his defense, he can give us the earth as a kingdom inheritance. So many of us have had the opportunity to show power or strength under control in our daily lives through, you know, life and things that happen. How many of us have done well and passed that test? You know, like when a teacher has treated your child unfairly in the classroom and said hurtful things and you just want to defend them. When a team sport is getting a little bit, you know, too aggressive, my son plays rugby and some of these parents are all up in there and sometimes they're yelling and they're yelling at your kid. <laughs> what do you do then? If an unfriendly friend is gossiping about you, we've all had that happen, and that's not quite how the story went, do you defend yourself? So why does Jesus instruct us to turn the other cheek? Unless it's to our benefit. So Jesus defends us through our participation in his meekness. So in order for him to defend us and before us, we have to participate in the meekness of Jesus Christ. He says that he resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh Lord, let us be a humble people. In the natural, we cannot be meek. It doesn't come natural to Ephoma. It doesn't come natural to Rebecca. Not to Rebecca. It's not a natural thing. It takes the grace of the Lord to empower us to be gentle when the flesh is irritated and it wants to fight. To be still and quiet when the Lord, when all we want to do is proclaim, Lord, look at this injustice. Look what they've done to me. However, we serve a just God, do we not? The Bible says that he does not slumber or sleep. We have a righteous advocate who petitions the Father for us daily. Whose blood blots out the accusations of the enemy against us. So let's let Jesus defend us. Amen? Amen? Let's let him prepare a table for us in the presence of our enemies. For this is the promise to us. Let's partake in the inheritance of the earth with him. After all, he has said the earth is his footstool. So now to this inheritance. What do we inherit by participating in meekness with Jesus? We inherit peace, and self-control. We inherit power to stand against the wiles of the enemy. We inherit wisdom and understanding and discerning of situations and circumstances for what they are. We inherit the earth by trusting in a sovereign God to walk all things, to, with, to walk out all things for us and work out all things for our good and for our benefit. So defending oneself is normal. It's a normal feeling to feel right away when someone has done something to us or to our children, anyone that we love. But meekness can simply mean to not react. Some of us need to just not react 
to things and people and situations. I'm reminded of a time when I worked at BMO Bank in Alliston during the pandemic. So I was uh, training. Gabriel knows the story, I think. So I was training, and uh, I was standing behind the register with uh, another young lady who was showing me the systems. And a, a customer came up, probably a regular one, because she knew the, te the teller there. And she said, oh, you're new. And the way she said it, I should have known she was about to say something crazy. <laughs> should have known. And I said, yes. You know, I was so happy. You know, I'm you. Yes, I'm you. She's like, she looks at my name tag, kind of squints in. And she says, what's your name? And I said, Ephoma. Slowly. Ephoma. And she said, what? And I said, Ephoma. And she said, and this was mid-pandemic, so this is like during the pandemic. She says, uh, um, that sounds like the new variant. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's what she said to me as I stood there. Okay. Immediately, my flesh was like, jump over the counter. <laughs> <laughs> my flesh was like, defend yourself, you phone. How dare she say this to you? But people Does she know who I am? You know? How, how could she say this to me? And I received a quicken from the Holy Spirit that said, don't defend yourself, just smile. And that's what I did. So I, I left, I walked away. Um, to the point where the next day, I, had, I didn't tell anyone, it was only the teller who was there with me that witnessed it, I didn't mention it to anyone. And the branch manager, when she came in, she called me to her office, and she was like, uh, Ifoma, uh, is everything okay? I heard about what happened yesterday, and I'm so sorry. And I was like, what happened? Because I was, it was gone. Yeah. The Lord took it from me. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, she mentioned it, and I said, oh, that's fine. That's fine. I'm fine. I know who I am in Christ, and I just prayed for that lady. <laughs> and she just kind of sat there, like, awkwardly, not expecting that I would say that. Mm -hmm. Right? But the Lord took it from me. Mm -hmm. Right? We... The Lord can take offense from us, Amen. right? But we have to position ourselves in that place of meekness and lowliness and humility, knowing that he is our great defender. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So what kind of love is this that we can choose not to defend ourselves? What kind of love is this that Christ has, has shown us to be an example of, has, that we're imitating in him? What kind of love is this? Younger Ifoma, outside of Christ, would have defended herself with vigor. <laughs> Christ in me, Ifoma, allows the Lord to defend me and to develop patience and self-control. It takes more strength to control yourself than to react in anger. Actually, reacting in anger is the weakest place we can be in, in our Christian walk. That's how the world behaves. Tit for tat, matching energy. I tell some people that I work with, they say, I stopped matching energy a long time ago because some people are, are, are functioning at a very low vibration and I'm not trying to go down there with them. <laughs> right? We don't match people's energy. We're imitating Christ. Amen. And God will give you opportunity after opportunity after opportunity until you get that. <laughs> Amen? Amen. We thank God for working it out in us for the process of sanctification. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So Paul admonished us in Philippians, in Philippians 4, 5 to let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. So there's a contrast in the Bible in Psalm 37 between the heritage of the righteous and the calamity of the wicked. So the righteous, we are called to cease from anger and to forsake wrath. Do not fret. The meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The Lord shall exalt you as you inherit the land. This is what Psalm, the Psalms is telling us about the righteous, the, the heritage of the righteous. Meekness is a willingness to submit to God. Are you willing? You know, God, my sister was talking about God 
being that still, small voice. I always tell people when I speak to them that the Lord is not a bully, he's, he's a gentleman. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. He's a gentleman, he's a gentle God. And he'll come in as far as you allow him in. So James 1.9 9, 9 tells us to let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. What does that mean? That means that when we take the low place, we allow room for the Lord to exalt us, to lift us up. So we are meek before men and being gentle, patient, and long-suffering. And we are told in Romans 8, 3 to 4 to live according to the Spirit. So we can be meek and inherit the earth as God works through us today. Someone who is meek doesn't hate people, even those who have hurt them or their loved ones. We act in a way that pleases God in all circumstances. How many circumstances? All. Oh. Oh. So power is choosing humility, choosing to be quiet, choosing to have a gentle nature. In meekness, we can partake of kingdom character. Hallelujah. So James 21 1 says, I lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save our souls. Hallelujah. Amen. The word of God implanted into us is able to save our souls. That's not the word on top of us, beside us, under our arm, in our purse, in our cup holder. It's implanted into us. There's an indwelling of the word that we must have that's able to save our souls. So when we look at the fruit of the Spirit, and my sister was talking about peace, when we look at self-control, especially in that type of situation, which we've all had situations where someone has been rude to us or you know, underhanded or something has happened, and God has given us opportunities to practice self-control. So the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace. In peace. So there's a fruit, which is the righteousness of Christ, not our own righteousness, that is sown in peace. Okay? So God's Word teaches us to have peace in the midst of every tragedy, even in mourning, as we talked about earlier. So it is normal to ask if God is in control and why has this or that happened to us. I'm reminded of a time, uh, I'm a flight attendant, and I was flying with a, and a colleague of mine, and we were sitting in the jump seat about to take off, and she was fiddling with her phone, and she was just sending a last message to someone, and she seemed a little distressed. And we call it jump seat confessions, because you don't need to know each other. But you tell each other all your business because you're just so close and it feels comfortable, right? Even if you just met someone. So we were just talking and uh, she was checking a last message from her sister-in-law. So the family had just been through a tragedy not too long ago. So the sister-in-law's, uh, her son, was killed by a drunk driver. And the day that we flew together would have been his 18th birthday. So that's why they were, it was just, everything was just fresh and coming back. It had only happened a few months before he was just 17. Wow. Uh, so, you know, any of us who have had children, my son's 16, you just, you feel it. You feel it. So I was uh, saddened and I was disturbed as we were getting ready to take off. Uh, we're supposed to be doing something called process, which is, uh, a process we go through for safety as we take off, which is passenger head count, routes of evacuation, operational exits, emergency equipment, safety, security, scenes and scenarios. So this is the process, it's called process that we go through. I couldn't go through my process. I was just, I, I, I had just met her, and I had never met her, her sister-in-law, but the grief, I, I could barely bear it within myself. But God has a way of putting you 
in the right place at the right time for someone else. Hallelujah. Yeah. Let us all desire to be the light to someone in need, that God can place us in that place, that we are so filled that we are able to pour out into someone's cup. So I asked her what I commonly ask, just how, how, do you, how does your faith help you to grieve? To try to understand whether they're believers or not or, or, or how I can comfort them. And she said that yes, we're Christians. Uh, the mother is so angry with God that even the last week when they were together, and they were supposed to, um, she, something happened and she would have said, thank God. She stopped herself, like, thank, mm -hmm. and couldn't even get out to say, thank God. Mm -hmm. Because she's so mad, she's so angry that God allowed this to happen to her son. And that hurt my heart. I was saddened. So I felt so, such deep empathy and compassion for this woman. And God brought to me, to remembrance, a testimony that I had listened to not too long before. So I watched a testimony of a woman in Australia who had suffered a similar tragedy. So this is how I was speaking to her to encourage her. So this woman and her husband, and then they have a few children, and they have a big farm and a big property. And the wife had gone into town to do the, the, the groceries and all the stuff, and she had left the husband with the children. Most of them were older, but there was one who was three years old, and he was sleeping. Uh, so the husband is doing his thing, and he uh, is operating heavy machinery out in the field. And the little boy came out, and he didn't see him, and the heavy machinery ended up taking his life. So the family was devastated. The husband was suffering from such deep guilt along with grieving. The wife was angry at God, angry at the husband, angry that she left at that time, angry at everything you can possibly think of. And the family was really going through it and they weren't sure if they were gonna make it as a family, as husband and wife. And one day, throughout this process, the wife got the strength to get up and have her coffee outside on the, on the deck. And she was having her coffee and she was just, you know, wrestling with the Lord in her heart, saying, why, why, Lord, why did you let this happen to me? That's my, my son, my son's gone, wrestling with him, asking all those questions that we ask. And God responded to her. And God said, I too lost a son. And she broke down. And that was it. Her grieving was done. Mm. Something in that word from the Lord comforted her and caused her to reestablish her relationship with him. And understanding came in her spirit, man, that God is not a distant God. Our God is not a God who, who's just you know, letting humanity go through what they're going through and not present at all. He's an ever-present God. So that comforted her. And that completely changed her grieving and reestablished her, her faith, her marriage, her life. She was able to be a mother again. So when I shared that story with the flight attendant who was sitting beside me, she broke down and then I broke down. Mm -hmm. And we're in the jump seat crying <laughs> together before we took off. God is so good. God is so present, especially in the midst of valleys. Mountains as well, but especially in valleys. God is with us. In Philippians 4, 7, we learn, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. So this peace, Jesus' peace, makes no sense to the world. In peace, we keep our mind on Jesus and his word. We meditate on his word, and we make his word come alive to us. Jesus says that he will keep us in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on him. Amen? Amen. 
It is impossible to understand God's preeminence in our inner man. We may never know why certain things happen to us, to people we know. What we need to understand is God's grace is sufficient for us to overcome, no matter what we go through. May the supernatural peace of God and Jesus be our portion. Hallelujah. The Bible says he is the Prince of Peace. Amen? Amen. Mighty Comforter. I am forever indebted to the Lord. It is easy to look at others and think, I would never have done that or said that. I would have handled this situation better. I have more faith in them. Really? That's how they reacted? If we truly are looking at ourselves, we would know that we are guilty of much worse. We fall short of God's glory daily. Many could say I have offended them knowingly or unknowingly. It's Christ's meekness that has taught me to look at every person the way God would see them. How does the Lord look at this person? Christ's meekness has taught me not to be rude, to be polite, I often say to myself, even though God may not be pleased with a certain behavior, God still loves them. And we, by that same measure of grace. After all, God's word says that he wishes that none should perish. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. So I have also learned not to hold people who do not know Christ to Christ's standard. Because this causes comparison and judgment. Instead, we are called to imitate Christ in our kingdom character. We are called to let our light so shine before men. Hallelujah. There's a parable in, uh, in Matthew about the unforgiving servant. So the comparison is the master who is in the position of power, who shows compassion. And then the unforgiving servant who lacks compassion in spite of needing the same compassion, even more so. Let us not be that servant. Hallelujah. We thank God for the word that he's given us today. Yes. We thank God that he empowers us to walk in meekness. He empowers us to take the lowly place, to walk in humility, to be submitted to his word. And I just pray over us today that God's word be written in our hearts, that we might not sin against it. That our default behavior might be to walk and act in meekness towards our brothers and sisters in and out of Christ. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I pray 